All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Friday seminar. Um, we're ready to get started. So it's my pleasure to uh, today to host uh, Professor Juho Kim. Uh, he's an associate professor in the School of Computing at Heist. Um, we're really lucky to have him today, uh, especially because he's in the U.S. for his sabbatical um, um, as a uh, working at Ringel, which maybe he'll tell you more yeah. about. Um, Duho is like an incredible human computer interaction scholar. His work has been awarded like more than 14 uh, old paper awards. All of us know how impressive that is. He's got on numerous research and teaching awards. Um, and today he'll talk to us about uh, his work in building intelligent interactive systems, especially related to interaction centric AI. Um, and, and I had the pleasure of meeting Juho in my first 2009. Yeah, yeah, 10 years ago. So I'm kind of honored to be able to, to host him here at UCI today. Um, so welcome. Thank you for the great introduction. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay. Especially people on Zoom, I guess. Um, great. Yeah, uh, this is a lovely Friday afternoon. I flew all the way from uh, San Francisco at uh, 5 a.m. this morning, um, and it's a day trip for me, which is perfect. And I, yeah, I really have been meaning to uh, visit uh, UC Irvine because there are many friends and colleagues, and I'm honored to uh, speak today uh, to you about uh, this idea of interaction-centric AI. So uh, for this particular audience, I don't think I need to convince you that interaction really matters uh, for designing AI applications and AI experiences. So instead of, you know, pitching the idea, I want to talk about sort of the, the morning after, right? Once AI gets deployed in the real world to, to actual users, what happens? Because that's not going to be the end of it, right? Uh, you build some AI application, you deploy it, we just watch, no, people learn, adapt, use, misuse, and, and you know, tinker with AI. AI keeps changing as well as more data comes in. So I want to talk about the various uh, interaction dynamics uh, that might be uh, important uh, for us, uh, people who are understanding, analyzing, and building and designing these uh, systems. And specifically, I want to share some case studies of some of these systems that I've uh, built and deployed uh, over the years especially focusing on what uh, worked as unexpected um, rather than expected uh, and the design lessons uh, from them. Audio is on. Can you mute your audio? Okay. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, there was that. All right. So I want to start off with this um, case of um, an operating room. So there are these uh, surgical robots that are being uh, more prevalent in operating rooms. There are uh, about 7,000 of these devices uh, in the world, uh, $2 million each. So from the hospital's point of view, it's a pretty big investment. Uh, the point that I want to try to make here is that focus on how it differs from the traditional operating room that, that we're used to seeing. Uh, in traditional operating rooms, you would have uh, surgeons assisted by uh, trainees, the, the residents, who are essentially uh, learning through apprenticeship. Uh, and see the difference? Where are the residents? What are they doing? Are they doing sort of over-the-shoulder learning, doing meaningful assi assistant uh, work? Not. Uh, more and more residents are indeed being kicked out uh, from operating rooms uh, for various reasons, like business reasons from the hospital's point of view. They are not really needed. There is nothing to actually watch and learn. Um, because surgeons are now, instead of uh, you know, directly operating on the patient's body, uh, they are looking through the screen using the controller to do all the work. Uh, so the unexpected interaction consequence, that's very interesting, uh, reported by Matt Bean, a collaborator of mine, um, who, who did ethnographic studies of you know, watching hundreds of these surg surgeries uh, in, in, with uh, robots, is that people, the, the residents, uh, who are not anymore getting enough chances to learn, they're finding alternative uh, ways to learn. 
which he dubbed as shadow learning. Uh, there are a few cases of shadow learning. For instance, uh, one might choose to do more uh, premature specialization, uh, where because uh, robots are a thing, uh, some of the residents chose to just focus on learning uh, how to work with robots, um, which was good. But then the side effect of that is uh, some of them just were not mature enough uh, with the basic uh, medical knowledge. Another common pattern was that they are turning more into uh, abstract rehearsals. Uh, for instance, these would be watching YouTube videos of surgeries um, or working with simulators. Uh, YouTube videos have especially been uh, commonly used by these residents, and some of them reported watching the same video for like 200 times to really master the skill. Quite impressive. And more and more people are uh, turning to this shadow mode of learning because their primary direct apprenticeship-based learning is not available anymore. Here's a completely different context. Uh, so this is the, the startup company that I'm uh, working with uh, during my sabbatical. Um, the company is called Ringle. It's a, a language tutoring platform. The, the way it works is that it connects a native speaking tutor uh, with a student who wants to learn the language and they have this uh, video one on one language session. What's interesting is that the whole session gets uh, recorded and tracked, which means that uh, from a, a more data and AI perspective, uh, there's this re really rich data of how a person learns a language over time, like each word by word gets uh, collected and tracked. Um, so with this company, what I'm currently doing is to build uh, this uh, automa automated feedback and diagnostic tool for English uh, proficiency. So let's say you uh, do a session, and after the session, the system would uh, automatically analyze a script and um, give you a report uh, based on your uh, complexity, fluency, and accuracy of your English proficiency. But the, the, the point that I want to actually get at uh, here is in the process, one of the important pieces of technology is automated speech recognition. Right. Once you do the video uh, session, it has to be turned into some script in text. Uh, for that, we rely on automated script, uh, speech recognition AI. But then, not surprisingly, the, the word error rate, how accurate the speech recognition is, uh, differs quite dramatically between the tutor's speech and the student's speech. Not surprising, right? Uh, can anyone take a guess as to, uh, on average, uh, you know, what would be the error rate in percentage uh, in the tutor's case? 30%. 30%. 11? It was actually 8%. So uh, pretty good, right? Um, but what about the student? Well, point is the student doesn't know whatever language. Correct, correct. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is when someone who's learning the language, um, their speech is fed into AI, how accurate would it be? 88. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> so the answer is 23. Uh, so eight versus 23, it's a, uh, um, I don't know what your interpretation would be, uh, but from someone who wants to build useful diagnostic tool with it, almost a quarter of speech is incorrectly labeled, right? Uh, with this, can we build a reliable diagnostic tool? Um, and also there's a huge uh, sort of uh, variance among uh, the, the, the groups here, right? Even within the tutors, there's someone with as low as six to um, all the way to 15. For students, someone even has 36% of error rate, uh, which makes it almost impossible to uh, do any meaningful AI work on top of it. So here, uh, the point is, the, the point that I think is worth mentioning is that people who need AI the most, like students who are struggling with the language, are actually disproportionately not getting the chance to be getting that support from the AI because AI even struggles to get the diagnostic uh, work to uh, start. Um, so this is an interesting sort of uh, real life um, you know, anecdote that I'm getting um, as I work uh, with this company. So all these two cases, uh, I think, are quite interesting in in the in the way that they are not the the most like immediate thing that you uh, you think of when you think about applying technology and AI to a particular setting like education. Um, but then these are the interesting uh, interaction dynamics that we see uh, from these cases. 
So there is lots of AI technologies these days. There are lots of users who potentially want to use uh, AI in their uh, contexts. Um, so it's almost like you know mixing this technology with users and their needs. And you know, as a system designers and builders can think about building these applications, but are we seeing lots of successful AI applications? Uh, my answer is very few of them indeed succeed. Um, so we need to understand why that's the case. So many of these will be obvious, but let me just quickly go over some of the issues that might arise between the human user and the interaction um, context. So from the AI point of view, um, many of the models are not really built for users in mind, built with users in mind. And, and you would often see that these models uh, you know, perform very well on benchmarks or they make uh, fancy video demos, but when they're put into the real life context, often they would uh, struggle for many reasons. And on the user side, uh, when I talk to people in different industries, um, and we recently had this interview study of about um, 20, 30 uh, AI practitioners uh, in different uh, domains, and what we're often seeing is that there's this unfounded optimism. You know, the, the, your C-level um, you know, management says, we have to use AI, make it work. But in practice, uh, your company's um, you know, uh, work uh, is not really an AI problem to begin with. Um, and there's also unrealistic and uninformed expectations of AI because of these reasons. And at the interaction side, uh, this is something that we know very well uh, from you know, uh, decades of HCI research that this gulf of uh, execution and gulf of valuation, right? Uh, from the user side, um, when they are trying to um, you know, work with AI, they might ask these kinds of questions. How does the system work? They want to understand how the system works and they want to have more control and agency. And it's known that many of these AI systems do not provide uh, the level of control and, and agency that people often want. In terms of Gulf of execution, when AI gives you some kind of uh, result like the automated uh, speech recognition result, um, people try to then interpret what's going on. What's the current state of the system? And that's where uh, concepts like explainability, interpretability, transparency come in. So this is the standard uh, sort of you know, HCI diagram uh, put in the context of AI. And of course, the mental model uh, comes in because as a user, we you know, constantly try to uh, establish and update our mental model to have a better understanding of how the system works. But a lot of research uh, has shown that for most people, constructing an accurate mental, of, uh, mental model of AI applications is really, really challenging. And there are various reasons. And these are the properties of uh, AI as technology. And many of them contribute to the, the making um, the construction of accurate mental model difficult. And this uh, really you know, famous paper by now, um, Salima's uh, paper on guidelines for human AI interaction uh, has articulated that uh, it's a rare, rather uh, unique design challenge in the sense that uh, applying usability guidelines that we know of to AI applications would often fail because of these characteristics of AI technology, right? System might be inconsistent when we always say, you know, consistent feedback from the system really matters. Uh, AI systems would often uh, fail to meet that goal and reaction might differ depending on conditions, different outputs, unpredictable errors. So all of these are, you know, bad UX practices, but with these technologies, sometimes they're just inevitable. But then what should we do? Like, should we wait until AI uh, technology, uh, you know, gets perfect uh, and until then, you know, uh, give up on designing them? And uh, in that sense, I think we need to think about the design paradigm of how we build these AI applications. Um, so model-centric AI is what I guess has been the driving force for most of the uh, AI technology development, thinking about the accuracy, thinking about building a model that's well-trained and beating the benchmark uh, numbers. And recently, people like Andrew Wang have been advocating for this idea behind data-centric AI, which uh, you've been probably hearing a lot these days. And data-centric AI basically says that 
just focusing on the model is not enough. We have to make sure that the data um, that you know, goes into the model has to be carefully planned, collected, processed, um, and also um, the whole pipeline, the, the operational pipeline has to be carefully designed, which will uh, increase the chance of AI applications success. But then interaction-centric AI is, is not necessarily something new. This is something that as HCI researchers, we already do. So I'm not arguing that I'm inventing this or you know, this is anything new. I'm just uh, you know, putting on the same spectrum of what, what an interaction-centric AI means and what uh, we should be focusing on. Um, here, I guess the important uh, part is that uh, it's about uh, designing the interaction in the complex real world context, like thinking about these unexpected consequences of AI and how users uh, perceive and, uh, and react to the system. So um, here's my sort of definition of uh, interaction centric AI. So this is hopefully the, the takeaway um, uh, slide uh, if you forget everything from this talk. Uh, it's an approach to systematically designing and engineering human AI interaction that overcomes the limitations of the model and data centric views. And of course, this is something we have been doing uh, for a long time, but I think as a field, we can try to move forward to making this into more systematic you know, frameworks and design processes that are specifically uh, well catered to uh, AI applications. And of course, as HCI researchers, uh, there are different ways we can contribute to this. And you know, many of you probably fall into some bucket here in terms of the, the research contributions that you're making with your research. Um, and in my own research, I uh, tend to focus a lot on system building. Um, and system building often results in these interactive systems that people can actually use. And I personally see myself as using system building as a research methodology uh, to answer the questions that I have about how AI can make a difference and whether it makes a difference. Okay, so enough of the uh, overview and let's uh, dive deeper into more concrete case studies. So today I'm going to talk to you uh, about uh, these three case studies uh, that uh, in my research group we've been uh, building over the years. And they all have some kind of learning component, learning meaning like human learning component, like in online education and chat-based group discussion where you uh, learn to talk with other people. And here, uh, the last example would be styling the web, um, like as a novice in web programming, uh, can we support them to express their intent in natural language? And maybe the system can help them um, find uh, the changes that they want to make. Um, so instead of focusing on the technical details of how we built the system, uh, I want to focus on after we built the system, what happened? Like did people uh, you know, perform as expected? Were there any unexpected observations? So I want to uh, you know, focus on these observations and hopefully that can trigger some interesting conversations. So uh, in the online education domain, uh, I want to talk about the system called AXIS. And the problem uh, that we started off is that in, in online, uh, there are lots of problems that we can solve. So let's say if you want to learn math, uh, there are lots of problems that you can find and solve, uh, but quality explanations are scarce, right? You get the correct answers easily, but why the answer is correct? Uh, is often very expensive to generate because you know expert time is uh, limited and quality uh, insurance is difficult. So we built this interface where uh, as a learner, you see this kind of problem, a like probability here, and you can type in the answer. It's very straightforward, right? And then the system gives you some kind of explanation. Again, very straightforward. But then interestingly, the system asks how helpful the explanation that you're seeing was. So the learner can answer this question and then they are given a chance to self-explain um, on their own, right? Give, provide their own version of explanation, which is known to be an effective technique uh, from uh, you know, uh, education uh, literature. So it's a, a simple way of sort of uh, providing that opportunity to learners. 
So that's the, the, the interface fairly standard, right? The people are just uh, solving the problem, getting the explanation, getting a chance to self-explain. Um, what's happening underneath is sort of the interesting part. Um, so what happens is that the system keeps collecting new explanations for that problem, right? As more and more people are solving, solving the problem because we're talking about an online context where hundreds and thousands of people might be solving the same problem. And this makes it a reinforcement learning formulation for those of you are, uh, who are familiar with it. But the, the main takeaway uh, from this, if you don't focus on the technology, is that the system has a problem of having many possible explanations and have the challenge of picking which explanation to show to the next learner who's coming into the system. So you might be wondering, why don't you just use the, the instructor's uh, explanation? But we, we've showed that that's always not the case. Uh, there may be better explanations from the learners. So what happens here is that just a, a quick overview is when a new explanation comes in, it keeps track of all the ratings that it's collected um, so far. And when something new comes in, it gets the new rating and the policy gets updated, meaning with what probability we want to pick this and show to the next learner. And the, the reason we do it in a rather complex manner rather than let's say simple sorting is that as new explanations come in, we want to give them a fair chance to be exposed to some people to get a, get a rating um, so that these new ones, if they are good, they will get more chances. So the idea is that ones that are highly rated get more chances to be exposed to more learners because that's, that's what we want to do as a, as a good system. So the rest is just you know, keep repeating this uh, as more people come in. So with this, the main um, result is that it was actually quite successful in helping people learn. So what happened was that people are getting the explanation that's generated by our system called Axis. And we compare that against showing the instructor generated explanation versus no explanation. And you can see that the learning gain, the score gain before and after um, was with no explanation, they still learned something about 3% of uh, learning increase was observed. Um, and when you are seeing the learn, uh, instructor's example, you get like nine points higher. Interestingly with Axis, it's slightly higher, although significant uh, statistical significant significance was not observed. But this means that in certain cases, um, learner's explanation actually beat uh, the instructor's explanation. And the point here is that it's a, it's a learner sourcing system in that uh, we ask learners uh, to do what they're good at or they're, what they're expected to do, which is to solve the problem and provide explanation and rate explanations. These are all quite natural activities that they would do as a learner. But on the other hand, AI uses that information to uh, do all sorts of things to figure out what explanation should get more chances for the upcoming learner coming into the system. And overall, what we get is better quality explanation and ultimately better learning. So this was the system that we built and now more to the lessons, design lessons part. Um, one interesting point here is that it was sort of an, uh, a case of how users and the system can learn at the same time. So if you think about it, uh, like most educational uh, technology focuses on helping people learn, or most of the machine learning systems focus on helping machines learn with more data and feedback. Um, but this was one example where the two are seamlessly connected uh, so that the learner was learning by using the system and the system was collecting useful data to learn, uh, do, to do its own learning. So this sort of like co-learning agents or co-learning systems, I think have uh, great potential uh, to be applied in more practical contexts because it's really a win-win for both sides. And also uh, if you remember this, uh, that I showed to you, the policy for next learner, even for someone who's not really an expert in, in machine learning, uh, can kind of intuitively understand 
you know, the higher percentage means that it has a higher probability to be shown to the next learner, which makes it actually easy for instructors to use this. So as a follow-up work, we indeed built a system for instructors to be able to use something like this to test different explanations that they might have to kind of see which ones work really well for their, uh, their students and not. The, the point here is that uh, interpretability really matters in that even for non-tech savvy instructors, being able to you know, present them with uh, some easily understandable uh, numbers to work with and simple testing tools uh, can really uh, help them improve their instruction. So uh, that was the first system. Now I want to uh, move on to a completely different domain. Now we're in a, a chat-based group discussion. So this was a system called uh, Solution Chat that was uh, presented at CHI 2020. Here we were uh, inspired by how sometimes you can have like online discussion, like on Slack, for example, can lead to like collective action or uh, important uh, groups design, uh, groups decisions uh, made through discussion. Um, but then we probably all have this kind of experience. Uh, it's really hard to have a good discussion online for various reasons. And one of the big things is that most social problems are ill-structured. They don't really have a one optimal solution. So people have to uh, think about alternatives, discuss, convince each other, and so on. And from the participant's point of view, you have to speak, listen, refute, and ask questions and defend all at the same time, which is quite demanding. And when you have moderators uh, in the discussion, they often suffer from this very high cognitive overhead in managing the discussion. So with this in mind, we built this system called Solution Chat. So the main idea is these you know, blue blocks that you see on the, on the uh, right, which are uh, real-time recommendations uh, for moderation of the chat. I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, what you see on the left is the uh, agenda panel. It's more like a, a summary of what's been going on in the discussion. Um, and you can pick sort of the most representative and you know, interesting ideas and pick them um, and, and vote on them uh, as a group. And as a group, you can maintain a fixed um, you know, shared agenda here so that uh, even as the chat goes on, you can kind of have a you know, sense of where we are as a group. On the right, you see these message recommendations. And this is the part that, of course, uh, uses AI. Um, so we were inspired by Gmail's smart reply, uh, which uh, you know, recommends all these uh, reply messages that you can use for the email, but for a group discussion. Um, so let's say you're a moderator. Uh, there are you know, a few different kinds of work you can do. For example, you might want to uh, pick someone who has not been speaking for a while and ask for their opinion. Or if the group seems to be you know, talking about something for too long, you can say, maybe we can move on to something else. Uh, the system kind of tries to give these kinds of contextual moderation recommendations. Uh, it's mouthful. Um, but shown in real time. So as an instructor, what you can do is to uh, pick anyone that seems relevant and ignore the rest. Um, you can just pick whatever seems helpful uh, for your moderation needs. So with this system, we wanted to see if this actually helps uh, moderators better manage their discussion and overall, uh, does it help um, the overall discussion dynamics and quality? So we ran this control study where we had 12 groups of four or five people um, and you know, each group had a, had a moderator. And we had three conditions, uh, one with our system, that was the one at the bottom and the baseline with the agenda panel without the recommendations and the baseline, which had the chat only. And some of the interesting um, findings that we had were that when people were getting the recommendation, the, the AI recommended uh, moderation messages, these are the blue ones at the bottom. You see a huge spike in the number of moderation messages that moderators use. Um, and our interpretation is that it's just a single button click. So people uh, you know, thought it was just easy to apply that. Um, and 
course, these were the, the contextually appropriate ones. Um, so many of them seem to have worked as expected. Um, with the agenda panel, the, uh, the messages have gone down a little bit. And part of it is because the agenda panel already serves as a summary. So there didn't really, uh, it, it demotivated the moderators to actually add their own moderation messages, which could save them time and effort. But then even with that, uh, we can see that uh, automated messages were you know, highly favored. And people had to, uh, with the agenda panel, uh, people didn't have to summarize messages a lot, which is a common task for the moderators to do because there is a summary panel. Uh, not surprisingly, the overall uh, summarizing messages were uh, went down quite a bit. And with the automated uh, recommendations, more uh, managerial messages of running the discussion itself, uh, the number has gone up uh, quite dramatically. Um, so the human AI interaction that's happening in this system is that uh, as a human, um, human moderator, they still manage the chat discussion while the system tries to understand the current discussion dynamics and tries to uh, you know, give you uh, some recommendations. And in terms of interaction, um, user still has the control of the discussion dynamics while uh, good moderation can happen. And again, I want to focus on the design lessons uh, from this uh, uh, system. So we were lucky enough to have the opportunity to deploy this system live to over 2000 um, users in a corporate education setting in South Korea. So due to the pandemic, uh, a lot of the corporate education uh, training and workshop programs have gone online. Uh, but then the company that we worked with uh, really still wanted to you know, give people more uh, interactive and discussion oriented experience. So they reached out to us. Uh, they wanted to use our system uh, as part of their discussion component. Um, so that's what we did. Yes. Was there any video interaction or was it all through chat? All, all through chat, chat. all through chat, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and some interesting observations that we made were that first, uh, people were actively exploring the system in the beginning. So they were kind of testing it to see how well it works, like how, how smart it was. So it was almost, a, almost like a group uh, mental model building um, activity. So when they were first entering the system, a lot of people would throw in some random messages to see how well it works. Sometimes they came up with like group strategies to say, you type in this and I will do this and let's see how it does. Uh, so that as a group, they try to kind of set the uh, shared uh, expectation of its capabilities, um, both and the, and the limitations. So this was a really uh, interesting sort of uh, Thing that happened almost in all the groups. And uh, another interesting point is that the recommendations, I think they were you know, fairly accurate and people had the choice to uh, discard the ones that don't matter. Um, but still there was a lot of social burden um, in using these recommendations. We thought it's a, just a single click. So it's going to be really you know, um, easy and simple, but then it wasn't as straightforward. AI was often being very picky and formal and the participants, uh, because of that participants experienced a social burden. So here are some examples. So these were indeed translated to English. So some of them uh, from Korean. So some of them might not be as smoothly translated, uh, but still the, um, the points are uh, communicated, I think. So yeah, the, the, this was the recommended message. I wonder what this uh, participant thinks. Can you tell us your opinion? So this was one of the recommended messages that the moderator selected. But then people are like, oh, AI seems to like this uh, participant, always picks on this person. And recommended messages keep wondering about the opinions of this person. He is favored by AI. AI seems to be biased. Right, so um, it was one interesting anecdote. And, and on the right, um, uh, one of the uh, moderators said, let's discuss the positive and negative aspects of introducing AI in any order. But then our AI was being too picky. Why is there no order? It's a, yeah, it's a systems mistake. Um, but then 
the person used the shivering uh, emoji uh, because you know it was too too aggressive. I'm afraid of replying to that question. It feels like nitpicking. So yeah, AI was sometimes uh, nitpicking, and people were kind of people had to add additional explanations to that. And in the last example, I'm doubtful about the credibility of AI. Person said, and thanks for your opinion. Uh, <laughs> I also think that, thanks for your opinion. Uh, thanks for sharing a good opinion. Shall we go to the next topic? Uh, sorry for my unnatural words as I am using AI recommendations. So the person ended up apologizing for continuously clicking the message recommendations. Um, so yeah, there were some interesting uh, social dynamics happening here. And as the person who had the control of which recommended message to choose, uh, they, they sort of had this social burden of explaining when things were not going expected and often the tone of the message um, was not something that they would naturally use but something more official and picky all right uh, moving on to the final example now again to a completely different domain now i want to talk about styling the the web um, so this was a kai 22 uh, paper fairly recent so in this uh, project, we wanted to see if people can use natural language to make uh, design changes on the website. Um, because, you know, as, as a novice user, um, people might still have changes that they want to make. For example, oh, this uh, color is really bad for my eyes. I want to make it you know, uh, less standing out. Or uh, you know, the, the menu bar is way too small. I want to make that part big. Um, but it's kind of hard to make these changes as, as someone who does not have web programming or CSS knowledge. So we thought, what if the person could just say something like tone down the text and the system can automatically infer that intent and tries to uh, suggest design changes. So that's what we did. We built this system and here's a quick demo. Oh, audio. Make this larger. Yeah, so here the, the user said, the user clicked on the KAIST uh, header and said, make this larger. And what you see is instead of just making the change, the system shows a bunch of recommendations um, that are related to make this larger. And if you think about it, making something larger uh, doesn't just mean the font size. It could have to do with the, the height and the padding and the width and even the font. So the system tries to show uh, some of the relevant uh, properties as well. Oops. Yeah, and, and the person can navigate through the recommendations and emphasize this part. And emphasize this part. Again, is fairly vague as uh, so the system tries to find things that are related to emphasis, like changing the font family, size, font style, font weight. You see that the recommendations are contextual, uh, depending on the user's uh, intent, uh, what you get shown is different. So to do this, we had a fairly complicated uh, AI pipeline with natural language processing to uh, infer the person's true intent coming from their natural language query. Uh, and the computer vision to we, we collected millions of design snippets from all over the web uh, and tries to uh, come up with good set of recommendations for a particular intent. So I'll not go into the details of the technology because that's not the point of what I want to talk about. Um, so we built this and we thought it was a really cool system. So we did some evaluation. Uh, we tried to compare this against sort of the state of the art, which is the, the development tools uh, in, in web browsers like Chrome, where you can uh, you know, make all these changes uh, manually. So we invited 40 people to the lab, uh, ran a between subject study, uh, comparing our, our tool named Stylet versus the Chrome development tools. Um, and we gave people two tasks. One was a well-defined task where we gave people sort of before and after, uh, and their task was to make the before image to something like the after. And in the second task, we gave them an open-ended task. Uh, we gave them this blank slate and they uh, could just do whatever work they want to do on top of it. And some of the positive uh, observations first, um, it was easy and successful. 80% um, of Stylet users were successfully uh, completing the task. 
whereas only 35% of people using the development tools have succeeded. And note that these are novice people who have no experience with uh, you know, web uh, programming and CSS. So 80% of success, I think, is quite, quite high. And people also completed the task in 35% less time. So they were able to do it uh, quicker. And we also looked at what kind of changes people make in terms of the count and diversity. Uh, so people made similar number of changes in both cases, but with Stylet, people explored more diverse properties. And we think this is because of the recommendation that the system provides, uh, rather than you giving one best uh, option, the system intentionally tries to provide multiple options people can choose from, and people, uh, as a result, uh, used more diverse options in their changes. So far, so good. Uh, we were really happy until we got into RQ3. Uh, so we looked into people's self-confidence, like how confident they are about the design tasks after using the system. So we asked this uh, three times, pre-task, and then after the first test, after the second task. So initially, there was an increase of self-confidence in both conditions, meaning uh, when you use the system for the first time, you accomplish something, people's self-confidence increased, which is good. Um, but then they got more used to the system and they now moved on to the second task. Interestingly, in the Chrome DevTools, people's confidence kept increasing. But in Stylet, the confidence level actually went down in task two. Um, so we looked into this more deeply. So in the Chrome uh, condition, people felt the accomplishment. Right, I had zero background in this, but then I learned this through the study and now I'm able to do it by myself, right? But then with Stylet users, they really liked how they were able to use natural language to do it, but eventually they wanted more control, but the system would always only ex uh, expect natural language queries, right? They might want to make more fine-grained uh, changes and sometimes even more direct changes, but the system didn't really support that. Um, so people said, I expected more surprising changes like glittering, and also uh, they were frustrated by the fact that they didn't have uh, more control. So this is sort of the, the conceptual graph that we were uh, able to observe. As the user knowledge of the task increases, our expectation is that the, the satisfaction would you know, go up too. But in reality, what happens was that it kind of fell down after uh, a certain point. So the lesson here was that the natural language can help novices quickly learn a new skill. So in, in this rapid acquisition, it was uh, helpful. Uh, but then the benefit quickly uh, decreases as people gain more knowledge. So in retrospect, it's kind of obvious, right? Uh, you know, if you look at the level of expertise, uh, the system could have maybe adapted uh, to people's level of expertise. So maybe more adaptive approach uh, could have been effective. So um, trying to wrap up. Um, so I shared with you these three case studies of AI infused interactive systems and some of the unexpected uh, findings in terms of how people interacted with the system. Uh, and a common question that I get is, many of these seem to be systems where things could have been completely automated. So for example, why not just you know, pick the best, automate, uh, best explanation by like doing some magical AI work? Or discussion moderation could have been completely uh, automated so that maybe there is this virtual moderator who does everything instead of having a human pick recommended messages or having this um, you know, automated design optimization without necessarily asking the user, just do the best work. But then this was indeed what we were initially thinking as well. It'd be cool to do this. But then there was our thought process. First, we thought about how to fully automate it. But then there's a why question, but why does that even matter? Right, uh, might make a cool demo, but you know why? Why do we need to do that in the first place? But then we came to ask, why not fully automated? Is there a reason not to do it? 
And of course, there are reasons not to do it. If you look at uh, the user's context, people might not want things automatically moderated when you're having a discussion. Maybe having a human moderator, um, you know, gives a better sense of you know community and group work and so on. Then the question is how not to fully automate it. This is actually a pretty difficult part because if you look at all these complex interaction um, dynamics, we need to pick which parts uh, deserve to be automated or are better to be automated, which parts should be left uh, as is and how the two should be connected in the entire user experience spectrum. And in the end, yeah, how, how the two could be glued together. So it's to support uh, human AI collaboration. So um, yeah, to wrap up, I, I said a lot of this already. I think uh, some of the takeaway messages from these deployments and case studies and observations are that you know, full automation is often not the answer. And it's somewhere in the middle where that sweet spot is. And finding that requires really careful understanding of the user's context, their struggles, and their needs. And we often think of, uh, you know, full AI versus full manual as a binary decision that we have to make, but that doesn't have to be, it could be a spectrum. And also it could be even two dimensional in that achieving a high level of human control and automation is challenging, but it could be done uh, with a good design process, good understanding of interaction and how to design it. And this is Ben Schneiderman's uh, 2D diagram of human-centered AI. And we can strive to get to this you know, high level of automation, high level of control. And I said this part a lot, the user experience uh, of AI should be considered because people are not static, uh, static objects that just receive what the AI gives them, but they constantly explore, evaluate, reevaluate, adapt and learn, misuse, abuse and tinker with things. And that's where things like explanation, feedback, the sense of agency, control, these um, ideas come in. And finally, more from the system building perspective, I think we need more uh, you know, robust and reusable building blocks for human AI interaction. And as I said, I mean, we uh, already have these set of um, interaction blocks for let's say graphical user interfaces or you know touch and haptic interfaces and that's i think uh, some of the really uh, inspiring work and results of hci research in these interaction dynamics but do we have uh, you know specialized uh, building blocks for human ai interaction if you think about maybe you no know, there could be these uh, ui widgets and components that can help people better understand the uncertainty of what AI gives people, or uh, helping people tinker with different uh, input and output to better uh, to get a better sense of uh, how AI works, or even in a group setting, maybe we can try to help people explicitly uh, establish a more accurate mental model by working together with the AI. And I think there's a lot of work uh, to be done in this space in all uh, kinds of um, human-centered work. So uh, yeah, I don't plan to read this out loud. I'll just uh, leave it uh, here. This is just a summary of my uh, message today and uh, I'll end it here. Thank you so much. Anyone has any questions? I'd be happy to answer. Yes, please. Um, this is really a lovely way of to the side of what you were talking about. But I was curious also back to the very first line about this idea of shadow learning, which seems like a slightly different construct, but also in line, I'm wondering, just to kind of go back full circle, how do you see that and what you're talking about relating in terms of your direction? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Also a pretty sharp question too, because I added that in last night. Ah. I'm trying to think how this, how this works with the rest of the talk. It's not like a, perfect match, but I kind of wanted to bring up because I know several people in the room are working in healthcare research. I wanted to make the connection. Um, but a more intelligent answer to that is, I think um, what shadow learning tells us is that technology should be built with different stakeholders in mind, right? Uh, and I think uh, the surgical robots 
often are built uh, with uh, optimizing or for, for increasing the efficiency of surgeries uh, for surgeons to do. But of course, they uh, can be better designed, I think, uh, with maybe apprenticeship in mind or collaborative work in mind. Um, and how would uh, residents be included uh, in that ecosystem, uh, which we currently don't see in these $2 million per unit um, um, devices? Um, and another thing is with more learning uh, related, uh, a lot of these residents um, have trouble accessing good quality cases. Right, uh, you only get uh, access to a handful of cases that you can physically attend to. Even that is, you know, decreasing because you're not invited to operator groups anymore. Um, so with the the video, um, with the interactive video uh, interface that we're currently building, what we're trying to do is to bring in all these different cases and trying to categorize them, help them navigate through different examples so that they know what to expect when something unexpected happens. So uh, this is ongoing sort of uh, system building work that we're doing on top of it um, that I didn't uh, really get to, but that's uh, another sort of connection. It seems to be the idea that even in these interactions with the AI, there may be other, other, other things that are happening that we don't think about when we about the main goals of designing AI and what are the other like constituencies who are affected and other goals like learning or training or apprenticeship and how can that be part of the picture? Right, right. Yeah. And, and, and as you really nicely put, often the, the main goal of building an AI, te AI technology mm -hmm. is quite uh, obvious, yeah, right? Exactly. But then we often overlook uh, these uh, side effects or unexpected consequences or other stakeholders who might be affected by this. And I think uh, we need a more systematic uh, inquiry and ways of understanding these uh, consequences, because often it's just patchwork that happens afterwards, right? You yeah. deploy it, you realize something has gone wrong or some people don't like it, then, oh, something went wrong, we'll, we're going to fix it. And, and I think that just being repeatedly happening in different domains is not really healthy. And I think we need a better way to do this. And yes. Any comments you need to, um, when you think about interactions with AI, um, you think about the you know, different types of people that AI will be so, what are your thoughts on accessibility as well, like in this design process currently? Like how do you um, see it hindering or helping people with various people? There are various people in the Right, right. Yeah, a fantastic question. And I, I know there are you know researchers looking into this in particular, although I'm not you know an expert on the domain um, domain itself. Um but one way I, I envision the, the whole sort of AI development is that there could be a research that raises a ceiling and there could be research that raises the floor. Uh, raising the ceiling means that it's exploring new ways of doing things like incredible demos that show something that was not possible before. And a lot of this work gets all the highlight and, and the spotlight of media and people and resource and funding and everything because that's the fancy part of AI. Um, but then, you know, all of these observations and the question earlier speaks to uh, that's often not the, the only important thing. And often there are many other important factors we need to consider. Um, and we currently don't have a lot of work uh, going into what it means to raising the uh, floor so that more people uh, can benefit from uh, potential benefits that we get from AI. And again, I think it's not a matter of, you know, like doing the homework kind of thing where, you know, you build whatever cool thing. And then when you have some spare time, you're going to, uh, you know, add diversity component to it. That's never going to succeed in real life because that extra space will never uh, happen. Right. So, um, the entire design cycle should really change to incorporate more diverse stakeholders and how their voices can be incorporated. And for example, in, in that space, uh, if people are interested, I strongly recommend reading uh, the jury learning uh, paper uh, from Michael Bernstein's group um, this year at Kai, where they try to come up with ways to incorporate diverse voices of people uh, in building uh, AI models. Yes. Um, 
I'm a little embarrassed to ask you this question that's to me. <laughs> but uh, maybe you have um, introduced me to the world of connected learning and this idea that we learn in peer or near peer groups where we become motivated um, and uh, to, to learn through socialization and through peer support. And so I'm wondering if you thought about um, you know, models where your AI isn't an expert teacher, but instead is modeled more like a peer or a near peer, or maybe even having groups of um, of humans and AI instead of like uh, you know uh, probability that one AI chooses one approach or another. You can actually have multiple APIs that are presenting different perspectives. Have you thought about a kind of more collaborative learning and also how systems like this may actually displace those uh, collaborative learning environments and Wow. Yeah, yeah, a fantastic question. And um, in, in my sort of conceptualization, I think a lot of the current work focuses on like near perfect AI and, and some human user interacting in one to one manner. And I think we can try to uh, diversify that by, let's say, like end to one, like can, can an AI come in and help group work? Uh, or one to n, can different AIs help me? do some creative work where this AI focuses on giving uh, something really interesting while this one is something more basic and you know uh, or it could be end to end or maybe you know human and AI partner comes in as a as a as a pair and there are you know multiple of them together so there are all these interesting uh, configurations and dynamics possible and I think we're only just beginning to scratch the surface uh, in this uh, and in the learning context, one of the ongoing projects uh, that we're doing at the moment is uh, what we call stupid tutor. Um, so we, um, and, and we really started off from that is because a lot of, uh, you know, use of AI in education has focused on how this really like Oracle AI is going to help people learn better. Uh, but can we challenge that notion? Because, you know, in like peer learning and things like that, we know that we often learn over the shoulder. We often learn from a person who's just been there um, and in peer learning, of course. So kind of to model that, can, can we have like intentionally dumbed down AI that can indeed yield better learning outcomes? Right, so than, I'm yeah. teaching the AI. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it could be like human teaching the AI and, and because you know AI is not as perfect as it needs to be, you, you intentionally become more um, critical, aware and alert in learning, which could potentially help you learn better. So that's our hypo hypothesis and we're actively working in that as so, well. Uh, yeah. Oh. First of all, thank you for applying all the way to capture. <laughs> it's a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> if it was like Seoul, I would have been more proud. But <laughs> like one hour fly was really, really tiring. <laughs> anyway, my question was more related to the multi banded arms. I was going to talk about the first uh, case study. So, my question was about awareness. Um, so, I was starting to think about how learners who are offered explanations at earlier stage will not have enough number of explanations that have compiled at that point. So I'm wondering for those earlier learners, it might be unfair for them because they don't have a wide array of explanations to be offered in the first place compared to learners who will have a wider range of options offered later on. So I was wondering if um if that was also taken into Right. Yeah. Fantastic question. So uh, there was indeed uh, some of the concerns that the instructors have raised uh, when looking at this kind of system is that uh, instructors care a lot about equity uh, and the, the opportunities that students get from this kind of technology. And, you know, they buy into the idea that over time, it's going to give really high quality explanations to more learners. But until we get to that point, there is this uh, cold start problem, right, when there is not enough um, people might have to suffer from having this suboptimal experience. Um, so this you know, technical approach itself does not address that, to be honest. Um, but with uh, instructors, what we discovered is that instructors wanted to use this, um, this kind of system um, by feeding in multiple versions of explanations to begin with. 
uh, and also adding theirs as the first seed. Um, so that's sort of the real life context that we you, you notice that could be useful. And instructors liked it because they wanted to make sure that at least the basic experience is going to be quite high. Um, and having multiple of them um, can ensure that, you know, they have some chance to experiment with different ways of explaining things. Um, so it's the still same system, but the way that's used by the instructors can uh, perhaps address that uh, challenge that you mentioned. So we're at time for the talk, but we have food and drinks outside, so stick around to talk to the, the Juho Moran. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.